What a wonderful privilege to have a language we can speak, and that language's name is music. It's a unifying language. If I play something, you hardly need words, and everyone around the whole globe can appreciate music. How poor would we have been if there was no music? And the great creator God has thought it well to give us this gift of music. I thought to take the building blocks of music, which is actually the principles of music. It's like building a house. If the foundation is fine, then it's easy to build the bricks on top. If you and I understand music, a few principles of the music, then it's easy to make a beautiful song or easy to recognize all the elements of that specific song. So the first element or building block of music that I want to discuss is actually the notation. If I say yes, it's a Y and an N and an S. And right around the world, everyone, everyone will be able to read my word yes or N-O for no. I can say no, I can say no, I can say no. It stays N-O because that's the written language of the words that I spoke. But as soon as you add music to it, there's a frequency or a tone how do I write that? How do I write something I sing into music? Yes, there are ways. You can use symbols, you can make your own notation. So the big word is notation. Notation is the language of music to explain it to other people. If you are good in hearing music, which most of us are, and most of us just learn music by playing it off by heart, but if I understand more of the principles, it's even better or easier to play it off by heart. So one of the first notations that was written for music was what we call the Do, Re, Mi. And it's written D-O-R-E-M-E, -E, Do, Re, Mi. And you get the Do, Re, Mi not only on the note of C, but you get the scale, which we call a major scale then. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, Do. Which means you can put this do re mi in any other on any other place of your piano. So this can also be do, although in the first uh, scale it was the fifth note. So you can say do re mi fa so la ti do, or do re mi fa so la ti do. So when you write Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, with a few dots, a few stripes, the people will know exactly where on the piano or what recollects that sound. So if you write just a Do with nothing, it will be this Do. And it will show on that specific paper where you write how long that specific note is, how high it is. Isn't that wonderful? And then in the classical era, they developed another way of writing music, which they call the stave notation, where there are five black lines and the notes are represented by little black dots or circles with either a tail on this side or a tail on that side uh, for different notes. And then if you see that specific note on that specific line or between the two lines, you know which it is. So I will play for you middle C. So in the music alphabet, there are only seven letters. It's A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then starting again with A, B, C, D, E, F, G. If you play on your piano, every eighth note is exactly the same than all the other notes. If you see a pattern here, there are three black notes, two black notes, three black notes, two black notes, three black notes, two black notes. One of the easiest ways to remember those black or that white notes is I say this is a donkey with two long ears. Can you show me another donkey? There's another donkey, there's another donkey, there's another donkey. And the donkey's ears is in the middle of its face and with its mouth it says D. D. So that's D, E, F, G, after G, it's not H, it's A again. So the seven note names on the uh, stave notation is A, B, C, D, E, F, G. 
if you would say do re mi it's do re mi fa so la ti and the eighth note is again do the two notes that look the same on the piano is called an octave and they are if we talk about frequency now they are exactly double the frequency of the previous one when we talk about frequency it means the pitch or the height of the note now we have a language to write music in but we don't know how high or how low it is so we talk about frequency but in music they normally talk about pitch which means these are the high notes those are the low notes and these are the middle notes when I taught children about high low and middle notes I had a symbol of a little birdie the little birdie in the tree the la, 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 la. and the children have to discern very high notes or in the middle the fish is swimming in the water, water, water. So the middle notes I use the symbol of a fish, and then for the lower notes I use an elephant. So, walking. so it's easy to discern high, low, and middle notes. But if the notes are close to one another and I play two notes, without looking at the notes you can close your eyes and then I ask the children high low or low high which one did I play first so if I do this it's high low if I play this low high but the closer the sounds come to one another for example low the first one was lower or I play that's difficult to discern High, low. an easy way is to sing the note and to feel on your muscles if there's any strain la, la. so when you sing there's a little more strain on your throat and on your vocal cords when you sing higher notes la, la. that is called the pitch and frequency is measured in Hertz because the guy who discovered the name of the wavelengths and gave meaning to it his name was Mr. Hertz and all classical instruments in the Western world are tuned to a specific frequency that makes it easy so when I go to Europe I'll still be able to play my piano or my guitar and I come to a symphony orchestra and all the instruments have the same standard they call that perfect pitch which is tuned according to A and the frequency for that A is 440 Hertz if I take exactly an octave how many octopus has got eight legs one two three four five six seven eight if I take the same note name which is A and I bring it down one octave it has half the value so if this is 440 Hertz then the low one will be 220 if this is 440 and I take it up one octave it is double the value so it's 880 so for every note on the piano there is a frequency and the frequency between this and the next note in, is measured in cents and there's also always a multiple of 11 cents so it's 11 22 33 or 44 cents between the note on the piano or the stave and the next stave just for those who like to have a little more facts so we talked about notation that was the first principle if you have a language in which you can read fine if you can read stave notation that's wonderful but not everybody needs that if you understand music and you know how the notes work you can simply write the note name or the chord name and everybody in the group will know where you are the next principle or building block that a song is built of is rhythm so you can't just play 
So you, we talk about a beat or a rhythm. A rhythm is a duplication or a repetition of a specific beat. The easy, easiest beats to learn is a two beat, a three beat and a four beat. One of the characteristics of a beat is that the first sound of that beat is played a fraction louder than the other sound. So if I play for example a chord here and I play a four beat I would say one, two, one, two, one, two. That's a march. So you learn, have to learn all the signatures, all the time signatures. Or you can play it in a three beat, which is three quarters. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Three, one, two. Then you've got a six eight, which is actually the loud beat on every six. So it's a la, 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 la. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's also related to the three beat. And then you've got the four beat, which is the most uh, regular one. It's one, two, three, four. 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 So you have to have a frequency, how high, or how low you sing the song and then you have to have a specific rhythm or beat that you play to. And then you can play, the fourth principle is tempo. How fast and how slow. So you can play a nice happy song. Rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice. So you're not going to play rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice. When you work with children, mostly children sing faster than adults, even their worship songs. So you can sing, how great is our God with adults, but you can't do that with children. You're going to sing, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. So you're going to play a little faster and you create a new mode also by the tempo or how fast. There are different names for different tempos and they are measured in beats per minute, BPM. So mostly when you have an application on your phone, you can download an application on your phone as well called the metronome. And on that metronome, you can have the three beat, the four beat and the two beat, but you can also have the tempos of those beats. So I quite often use the, um, the metronome app because in that metronome, there are different tempos and they are measured so if I play 122 beats per minute, Allegro is in the name of that tempo. It's a four beat. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And then I'm going to make it a little bit faster. 120 is the most common beat. That's most rock music. It's, it's got a one, two, three, four, 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 one, two, three. So you get a click track on most of your music recorders where you can listen to it. Why do we talk about tempo? Because children sing sometimes faster. It's always better to play without a click track unless you are recording. Why? Because you can interpret your own music on different, um, in different styles and sometimes in the end or in the beginning when they learn still the song you go slower and later on you go faster. I never play with backtracks anymore because of this, because the tempo is affected by it and even, I, even if I sing some of my old songs I say I can't believe I sang that song so fast or I can't believe that, that, that I didn't bring any kind of feeling in into the song. So let me take a little lower, 100, sit, allegretto, that's a bit slower, let's make it slower, 80, sit, that's andantino, let's make it faster, 150, sit. 
in Italian they have different names and one of the slowest one is in the Largo Allegro it's a medium tempo um, then Largo is very slow and let's do 180 Precissimo is very fast so you don't have to learn those words it's just for interesting sake but you can can get your three beats your four beats and you can change them on this application and use it alongside your temper we learned about notation that's the written language of music we learned about frequency or pitch that's how high or how low we learned about the beat and the rhythm, a three beat or a four beat. We learned about a tempo, how fast and how slow. The fifth one is very easy, the dynamics, which actually is the volume in which you play. When you have all these instruments together, we tend to put the volume mostly of the accompaniment too loud. So there are quite a few rules which we can discuss when we get there, but it's important to play at the right volume. So it's actually the dynamics by which we play. So if I play a worship song, I'd rather play a little softer. When I play a march song, I'll go. So the dynamics is how soft and how loud I play. So this is very efficient when you want to create a mood is to add some volume or to take away some volume. I wonder if you knew that you ha also have a decibel meter and the volume is measured in decibel. So I have this app for tuning my guitar on this phone. I have the app of the rhythm which is the beat. I have a mixing app for the music and then I have one that measures how loud I play. So for the pitch or for the frequency, I also have an app. I call it my pitch app. So if I sing, la, it gives me exactly the note that I sang just now and what the hertz is for that specific one. So you get an app to show you the pitch, you get an app to show you the beat, you get an app to show you the tempo and you get an application to show you how loud your music is. If you put this one in the aeroplane, most probably it will be like 90 to 120 decibels. So decibels is a, a measure in which we measure, measure the dynamics or the volume. If you put any music or any sound at higher than 80 decibels for longer than an hour, three quarter or an hour, you can harm some of the uh, little hair in your middle ear. You can harm those. It's just like a very strong wind blowing through a bush, um, uprooting all those trees. And you get quite a few people listening to music all day through their earphones, especially young people who turn deaf at the age of 20 and 25 because they tuned their music too loud. It's very important to enjoy loud music. But it's just as important to protect your ears. Even if, a ba if you bring a baby into a hall where there are big speakers, rather protect the baby's ear, rather protect your own ears. So we can sing aloud and God loves a joyful noise. But we tend to put our sound systems way too loud and we tend to sing um, and listen to music way too loud than we should. The next thing we have to learn in music is the note values. Some notes are long. La. Some notes are a bit shorter. La. Some notes are quite short. And when you have the stave notation, you can write those down by using a whole note, counting four. La, 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 la. Or a half note, counting two. La, uh. Or a quarter note, counting one. Ta. Or an eighth note that two of them is the same value as one or four sixteenth notes of which four equals one um, quarter note so it's important to know that some notes are longer and some notes are shorter that's the notes note values and you also have that values for the rest in between notes so if you have the stave notation it means that they will show little blocks there showing you how to read music and to know when to rest and when to sing when to keep quiet 
Now, very interesting. Uh, some people say this song is in G. Yes, you can play it in G. But because in one octave there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve different semitones. So one piano key that's next to that one, whether black or white, that's called a semitone. So between C and that one is only a semitone. Between that one and that one is a semitone, but between that one and that one is a full tone. Between B and C, there's no other black notes, also a semitone. So in one octave, you have 12 different semitones, which means in the classical music, you can play any song on a piano or a guitar or an in instrument in 12 different keys. So I'm going to sing Amazing Grace or I sing Amazing Grace or 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 uh, amazing grace or amazing grace or amazing grace so you can use 12 different keys piano keys with their chords to sing any song that's still limited because between this note and this note there are about 33 different sounds if we measure them in cents which means if you don't play the piano you don't have to sing on C or on C sharp or on C flat, which is B. You can sing somewhere in between there that doesn't appear on the piano. If you listen to the sound of birds, they don't hardly sing any of these notes. They've got their own notes, and that is so beautiful, and that's so musical, but it's not the same notes that we have on the piano. So didn't God give us this amazing gift of knowing the different keys, of being able to play, in one octave in 12 different chords or different keys. You should know what is a sharp and what is a flat. A sharp is a semitone above and a flat is a semitone lower than. So F has a sharp and that's F sharp. It's the same note as G flat. So this note on the piano has got two names F sharp and G flat. This one's name is G sharp and A flat. A sharp and B flat. So this is just the introduction to what you should know about piano. You need, need to know the names of the notes. Next, you need to name the notes of the names of the scales and you need to know the intervals and then you need to know the chords. I put all of those in one category. The basic two types of scales is the major scale and the minor scale. The major scale is the do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. The minor scale sounds a little different. It's got So we won't learn about the scales now. And then there are on top of those some other types of scales. The chromatic scale is playing every single semitone. But you hardly sing in those scales. So the scales, scales we sing in are the major scales and the minor scales. An interval is the distance between two notes. So if this is the first note, the full note after that, number two in my Do, Re, Mi ladder is number two. The next one is number three. The next one is number four. And interval is the distance between two notes. So I can play one, four, or one, five, one, six, one, seven, one, eight. And as I play by ear, it is very nice to know when it is a fifth, or a fourth, or a third, or a second, or a sixth, or a seventh, or an eighth. Because then you can ease more easily play off by heart or off by ear if you know the intervals. If you take the first and the third and the fifth note of a major scale or a minor scale, 
you get a core. So the chords are the building stones for accompaniment. So with your left hand mostly, you play the chords. But when you do accompaniment, no one plays the right hand notes anymore. You use both hands to play the chords in the lower part of your piano or of your keyboard. With guitar it's totally different. With guitar most people only play the chords and sometimes with lead the guitar they can play the melody. But with accompanying music in a church or in a school you hardly ever need to sing the song. So most of the teachers in the school they still play the melody but it's not necessary unless you have to teach the children the melody. Because there are 12 different keys on the piano, you need to know these note names. C, C sharp, D flat, D, E flat, D sharp or E flat, E, F, F sharp or G flat, G, G sharp or A flat, A, B flat or A sharp, B, and then again C. So you need to know these names, even if you just memorize one octave and the names because you use this as a basis of the note names for any other instrument which you play. Why? Now I play a song in G and I say Amazing grace, how sweet the song But now the song is a bit high. If this was G, what is lower than G? It's easy if you memorize this. F is lower, E is lower, D is lower, C is lower. But C is also much higher. So you can go a little higher, say if this one was too low, you go one up, which is A, or you go one down, which is F. So it's good to know not only the note names, but to memorize a whole octave of the piano in your head. So when you start with chord progression, and that's the next one. When you start with chord progression, it means that most of the songs have at least, at least three chords. Mostly it's the first major chord, the fourth major chord of that scale, and the fifth major chord. You have to learn that if you take the first note, which is in C, and you have specific rhymes and ways to, to find it out, and you know that you're going to use what we call the subdominant, which is the fourth, and the dominant, which is the fifth, fifth which I'll explain later, you know how to play any song in its own three chords. So D goes with G and with A. C goes with F and with G. So if you know that, it's easy to remember which chords to play together. We call that chord progression. And the circle of fifths is an easy way to remember that especially when you compose your own song or when you write your own song. If you, for example, just start by playing chords. Meaning that that set of chords repeat itself many times in the song, maybe a few times, and then you change to other chord progression. So if you use C, A minor, F and G, and you play those chords over and over according to what belongs together, then it's very easy to sing a song, but also easy to transpose a song and write it over in another chord that's higher or that's lower. The last one, melody and phrasing. When you play in a major chord scale, you can use any of those notes, whether you play with your right hand number one or number four or number five. So you can go along. With phrasing it means how do you fill in those notes. You can either play it la 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 or you can play You can play. The 
notes, how long the notes are, and how do you fit that melody into the rhythm or the beat. So can we name them quickly? The first one, notation. The second one, frequency. The next one, the beat and the rhythm. The fourth one, the tempo. The fifth one, the dynamics. The sixth one, the notes, note values, and how long you should rest and how long the notes are. The se number seven, the names of the notes, the scales, uh, the intervals, and the chords. Number nine, uh, the chord progression for composing and transposing, and number 10, the melody and the phrasing. There are quite a few others. You can write in a specific genre, you can write in a specific style, you can write, add some emotion, and we haven't even touched the matter of writing lyrics for songs or even the instruments you play with. So those are four more that you can explore on. But for a basis, it's good to know that music has so many elements but they all are important for any song.